That's good. Good to hear. All right, let's pray. Uh, God, as we uh, come to seek who you are better, it's, as we read your word, as we seek to understand your revelation, how you revealed yourself, your history, the history of your, of your prophets and apostles, we just seek to be able to represent you better, to understand your truth. We're thankful for those who are here. Uh, we're thankful for Roger for getting on the hospital. We're thankful for a lot of those that have recovered from illnesses and injuries. We continue to pray for those who are not, who are uh, either hurting or sick or traveling. We pray that we are showing grace and mercy as always uh, to one another as you have shown grace and mercy to us. Thank you for this evening. We pray that we do honor to you in our words, our thoughts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, we are in the book of Acts. It is a historical tome about the activity of the apostles and God as the message of Jesus Christ is spread from Jerusalem to Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. This is Acts lesson number 26. We are kind of doing a slight backtrack. We are looking at Acts 4, 23 through 31, the prayer of the persecuted. And we're looking at two specific ideas. That is, number one, the sovereignty of God, and number two, boldness. Um, I want to kind of focus on this uh, in, in detail. Uh, there will be other things that we look at, uh, specifically the use of Psalm 2 in Acts 4. Uh, but I want to make sure that we go back and relook at this because I think this is a very powerful prayer of the apostles and disciples as they are in facing persecution for the first time. Uh, remember that the book of Acts captures the events of the apostles as Peter and Paul spread the word of Jesus Christ. Acts is a book of transition. Uh, again, I, I wish there was a better word than transition. I'm not a big fan of it. I think that uh, um, the idea is, is that we have both the Jewish understanding of their eschatology and plan running parallel to that of the plan of the Gentiles. Unbeknownst to the Jews at that time, specifically the first generation believers in Judea, the, the, the return of the Lord is not going to come for thousands of years. Where the plan of God for the for Gentiles, they take off with it. And... Very quickly, about 100 years after the, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the Gentiles become the predominant believers in Jesus. Uh, even today, um, you know, obviously the Gentiles vastly outnumber the amount of believers that are that, that of, in Jesus Christ than the Jews. Although there are a significant amount of Jews, both in Israel and throughout the world, who believe in Jesus. One of the highest, popu highest percentage of ethnicities that believe in Jesus are, in fact, Jews. So they're still a very good... Um, remnant still to this day. The book of Acts concerns the church, but is not about the church. And some people have a problem with this because obviously Paul starts doing his missionary trips and whatnot, and they go, and you could say that those are more about the church, but specifically the first portion of Acts is not about the church. It does concern the church because we need to learn about what God is doing um, and what he d does do concerning the apostolic era. Uh, but because it's not about the church, nor is it to the church, we must not build doctrine from the book of Acts because it's historical. It is descriptive, not prescriptive. And so we don't build doctrine from the book of Acts unless we can substantiate it in the epistles. Now, in Acts chapter 4, we have Peter and John healing a lame beggar. After they give a, a lesson in Acts chapter 3, they were taken into custody by the same Jewish leadership who tried and handed over Jesus for crucifixion. The same Jewish leadership that Peter and John were deathly afraid of, that every single one of the apostles ran away and hid for fear of these Jews. Now Peter and John are taken into custody by these same Jews. We talked about the captain of the guards, the same captain that was there when he took Jesus in the garden. So it's not different people. It's not a changeover of scenery. It's the exact same individuals. And if they were fearful back then, do you think that that fear is transferred? Or do you think that all of a sudden, no, we're no longer fearful? There's no indication that they're not fearful. In fact, their prayer demonstrates that they had to overcome some fears. Number two, the Holy Spirit gave Peter what to say. Peter wasn't like, hey, I got this now. Peter was still an unequipped man. The only thing that he had different was the fact that now the Holy Spirit was going to talk through Peter or give Peter what to say, rather than Peter having to come up with his own defenses. The entire defense that Peter gives to the Sanhedrin 
is the about a messianic proclamation for Israel. It's not about how to go to heaven. It's not about how to have eternal life. It's not even about forgiveness of sins. It's about the Jewish end game, what they were supposed to do and how they are failing in regard to the messianic plan of for Israel that God had. We talked about this statement that Jesus is the stone that was rejected, but he became the chief cornerstone. And, and then after Peter gave his, uh, his defense and the fact that they saw a miracle, the Sanhedrin, who were the same group of people who tried Jesus, beat Jesus, handed over Jesus to the Romans for crucifixion, who were powerless to do anything to Peter and John. Not because, the, and again, I, I don't want to be facetious, but I'll, I'm going to go ahead and say this. Not because God's hand of protection was upon Peter and John. But because they feared the people. The Sanhedrin were not respecters of the law. That's evident with the trial of Jesus. But they were fearful of the people because the miracle was done, was highly attested, and everyone knew who the man was. And 5,000 believers came about in Jerusalem in the temple that day. They cannot deny this. So if all of a sudden they had this huge miracle and they persecute somebody for a miracle, how, how do they respond to the people? So they just simply warn them. They threaten them. And then again, Peter... I find this to be amazing. Does not go, whatever, we'll just leave. And then he goes out and just does what he's supposed to do. He tells them to their faces, I am not going to stop. That's bold. We'll talk about boldness in a minute, but that is bold. Then we have the prayer of the persecuted, which we, we went over briefly, kind of outlined it last week. But then we're going to go into more detail tonight. And then it finishes up with unity among the believers. So prayer for the per, of the persecuted and unity among the believers. So let's go ahead and go back at, into Acts chapter 4. We'll look at verses 23 through 31. We'll read it, make some observations, and try to understand what they're saying better. And at the end, uh, I'm going to ask a question about how does this concept or idea in principle apply to us? Okay? So when they had been released... They went to their own companions and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And when they heard this, they lifted their voices to God with one accord and said, O Lord, it is you who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. Who by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of our father David, your servant said, why did the Gentiles rage and the people devise futile things? The kings of the earth took their stand, and their rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your purpose predestined to occur. And now, Lord, take note of their threats and grant that your bondservants may speak your word with all confidence. While you extend your hand to heal and signs and wonders take place through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed the prayer, the place where they had gathered together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God with boldness. So before we begin, I, met, I mentioned last week something about kind of reading the, the narrative here in Acts and trying to figure out exactly the underlying attitude and history of this. So I do have a theory. I have a theory that the apostles and disciples at this time, at when, when Peter and John went into that temple, at that time, the apostles and disciples were still very fearful and were not promoting the truth openly. Back in Acts chapter 2, after the um, Pe Pentecost events, they were going from house to house and people were being added to the numbers. But the one thing that that is that does not say there is that they were uh, not openly or boldly in the temple teaching these things on a regular basis. They were teaching these things, but they the, the either their 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 courage waned, their their boldness waned, or they were still acting in a lot of fear 
because they had not had a direct confrontation yet with the Sanhedrin. Remember, the Sanhedrin didn't get involved unless they really started caring. And now Peter and John went into the temple, and now they started caring what's going to happen. By the way, do you think Peter and John's um, report of their arrest hit the ears of the apostles and disciples? How do you think that night went? Peter and John are arrested by the Sanhedrin. Again, I don't know how long it was previous to this that Jesus was arrested, tried, crucified. What do you think is very real in their minds? Hmm. So the Sanhedrin being powerless because of the miracle, because of the fear of the people, Peter and John gave a full detailed report about their arrest and trial. In response to the report, they prayed to and glorified God. So one of the first things they say here is that they lifted their voice with one accord. So with one thought, with one voice. Now, they lifted their voice with one accord. Now, the word one accord is homothumadon. Homothumadon. This word is a very common word in the book of Acts. It's actually almost exclusively used in the book of Acts. It's used one time in Romans chapter 15, where Paul prays and expresses them that his prayer that they are also huma thamadon. But the word itself is actually quite interesting. In Acts chapter 1, verse 14, we see this first time. And I do believe I brought this out, that all that these are all in one of mind when continually devoting themselves to prayer along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, with his brothers. They were of one mind devoting themselves to prayer. One mind, okay? They were of one thought. It's usually how this is understood, one accord. Acts 2, 1, when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together, all together in one place. Same word, all together. Now, this seems to be more of a physical altogetherness, but the word itself is used in conjunction with this idea of one thought. Acts 2.46. By, by day, continuing with one mind in the temple, breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart. So they were, again, together. Acts 5. Now we get to see something a little bit different. This is Acts 5, 1 through 12. It's not Acts 5. This is, I'm not supposed to go, no, it's supposed to be just verse 12. Sorry about that. Let me skip ahead. Skip ahead, skip ahead, skip ahead. That'll be next week. Verse 12. I think this is just Acts 5. At the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were taking place among the people, and they were all in one accord in Solomon's portico. One accord. Okay? Same idea. But now, Acts 7. Come on. Okay, I doesn't want to do Acts 7 now. Okay, I want to read Acts 7. So turn with me to Acts chapter 7, all the way down to verse 54. Oh, weird. Verse 54. Now, this is after Stephen's defense. Stephen gives a defense to the Jews about what he has already said concerning the person of Jesus Christ and holds them accountable as the same uh, disastrous efforts that they had against the prophets in the Old Testament. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the quick and they began gnashing their teeth at him. But being full of the Holy Spirit, he gazed intently into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, behold, I see the Son of Man... I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice and covered their ears and rushed at him with one impulse. When they had driven him out of the city, they began stoning him. And the witness laid aside the robes of the feet of a young man named Saul. They went on stoning Stephen as, they call, as he called on the Lord and said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling on his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Having said this, he fell asleep. Where do you think the word that was used by the apostles that they were all in one accord is in this passage? Verse 57, one impulse. See, the word itself is a compound word. How many recognize that? 
You got the hama there, homois, and thumos. What does the word thumos mean? The word thumos is mostly translated angry, but we know that the actual root meaning is passion. It can be a negative passion like anger or wrath or a positive passion like a, des a great desire to, to do something. And it could be used negatively or positively. So in the same way, hamathumadan means together with one passion. This led me to think. This word is used throughout the book of Acts, and it's encouraged in Romans 15. And there are times in which we as a body of believers are very good at having the same message. Having the same thoughts being very clear on the doctrines that are very important, and then we discuss the things that are peripheral. But do we have the same passion? Just a curiosity. I'm not, I'm not trying to apply this verse to us. It just got me thinking. Are we of the same passion? Do we have the same goal, and do we all work towards that same goal with fervor? They had the same passion. So when they heard the report, they were passionately together in one accord, saying the same thing concerning the person of God, and they, and they had one prayer. In the prayer itself, in Acts chapter 4, how do they begin? I am not saying that we need to pray the same thing over and over again, by far. That, I don't, we shouldn't do it. But one of the things I do recognize, that within the prayers of the Bible— one of the things that they begin with in, re in regards to their prayers is a recognition of the identity of God in a very specific manner. It's not simply saying, oh, God, or Heavenly Father, although that is used. The more predominant one is a, is a recognition of who he is. Here, they recognize he is the God of creation. It is you who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. Now, notice in your Bibles, if you have a, if it has quotes, that that is a quote because it is a quote. It's a consistent moniker for the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of Israel. So you can go ahead and call him the God of creation. You can go ahead and call him, as in Daniel, the God who reveals mysteries. You can say the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and it's all referring to the same person. But it's very interesting that he often refers to himself and he's often referred to the Bible as the God who created the heavens, the earth, and, and the sea, and all that is in them. So Exodus chapter 20, verse 11, for in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them. Nehemiah chapter 6, chapter 9, sorry, verse 6, you alone are the Lord. You made the heavens, the, the heaven of heavens with all their hosts, the earth and all that is on it, the seas and all that is in them. You give life to all of them, and the heavenly host bows down before you. He is the God who made everything. Psalm 146. Now, I don't know for certain if the apostles have a specific thought in mind when quoting this particular passage. Are they quoting Psalm 146? Quite possibly. Are they simply quoting a very well-known moniker for the, God of, for, the, for the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? That is, the God of creation. I don't know. I will say this, a lot of times when they're referring to doctrinal understanding concerning God, they often are referring to the Psalms. Okay? And specifically, why do I say this here? <clears throat> Who by the Holy Spirit, through the mouth of our father David, your servant said, and then he quotes another Psalm. So, for me, I think... They're quoting Psalm 146, and I think that's very important, especially if you read the entire psalm. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. I will praise the Lord while I live. I will sing praises to my God while, while I have my being. Do not trust in princes, in mortal man, in whom there is no salvation. His spirit departs, he returns to the earth, and that very day his thoughts perish. How blessed is he whose help is God, the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord his God, who made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, who keeps faith forever, 
who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets the prisoners free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord raises up those who bow down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord protects the strangers. He supports the fatherless and the widow, but he thwarts the way of the wicked. The Lord will reign forever. Your God, O Zion, to all generations, praise the Lord. Now, just taking Psalm 146 on its face, how appropriate is that psalm in the situation of these men, of these believers, of that generation, who had very little? Why did they have to share all their possessions? Because the poor were indeed poor. It wasn't like they had less, and so they wanted to make everybody equal. The poor were literally hungry, not eating for days. Literally unclothed, have maybe one set of clothing, and if they hit winter hit, they were freezing. No shelter. So how do you take care of one another? They had to sell off their possessions to help, and they did so willingly. So when you read the book of Psalms, and you read Psalm 146, then think about the fact that they quote that particular portion of it. I think that they are pulling upon their idea of who God is, that he is the one who protects. He is the one who is the creator of all things. You can say this is an appeal to his sovereignty and an appeal to what's next. You thwart the wicked. Who are the wicked? So it's a very consistent moniker. In fact, Paul uses it again in Acts chapter 14. At Lystra, a man who was sitting, who had no strength in his feet, lame from his mother's womb, who had never walked. This man was listening to Paul as he spoke, who when he fixed his gaze on him, had seen how he had faith to be made well, and with a loud voice had stand upright on your feet, and he leaped up and began to walk. When the crowd saw that Paul had done this, they raised their voice, saying the Lyconian language, the gods have become like men and have come down to us. And they began calling Barnabas Zeus and Paul Hermes because he was the chief speaker. The priest of Zeus, whose temple was just outside the city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates and wanted to offer sacrifices with the crowds. How does Paul respond? But when the apostle Barnabas and Paul heard of it, they tore their robes and rushed out of the crowd, crying out, saying, Men, why are you doing these things? We are also men of the same nature as you and preach the gospel to you that who that you should turn from these vain things to a living God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. Very interestingly enough, being that Acts chapter 4 also refers to the Gentiles who rage against the Messiah. Paul also uses this as to identify the God of heaven the true and living God who made the heavens and the earth and all is in them to identify who he is to Gentiles. Interesting. One of the aspects that we make when we dealt with Genesis and we dealt with our the text of the Old Testament, and I like to point this out in this area as well, is that in these verses, it's not the God who creates. It's the God who created that God is not perpetually creating. He's not trying to always fix things and recreating things. He finished creating in six days. So it's not a God who creates, although he's fully capable of doing so. He's always referred to as the one who made the heavens and the earth and all that is in them. Keep that in mind. Think about the God of creation. Think about who we are as people. What is the significance between us individually or even as a group and the God of creation? One of the things that we talk about is that God has no need for man. That if man did not exist, would God be any less complete, any less satisfied? He's the God of creation, omniscient, omnipotent. His creative work is well known to us. The power that it has to hold within his voice, within his mind, is beyond comprehension for us. We as humans, as his creation, rebelled against him, even though we were created by him. 
And he has no obligation to us in any form or any manner. That God of creation revealed himself, not just through creation. If that's what he wanted to do it, that would be enough. But we wouldn't know him. The God of creation revealed himself through the prophets. He spoke to man in language that can be understood so that we would understand who he is. I still find that when you ponder that, I find that to be one of the most remarkable acts of grace that I could possibly understand. Is that more remarkable than his death on the cross for my sin? No. But that's, he has nothing, he owes us nothing. And he revealed him to, him to us. Not only did he reveal himself to us, he died for us. I'm not sure if I still fully understand that role respect it as well as I should. After they understand that he is the Lord of God, he's the Lord God who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. He's the creator of God. He's the one that revealed himself to prophets. Then they quote the second psalm. The second psalm presents an unusual uh, issue for us. Let's go ahead and read the second psalm fully. Now, they only quote the first couple of verses here, which I find to be very interesting. We'll see why in a second. But there are people that make certain cross-references to Psalm 2 that I think we need to talk about. Where are the nations in an uproar and the people devising a vain thing? The kings of the earth take their stand and their rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. That's the word Mashiach, by the way, Messiah. Saying, let us tear their fetters apart and cast away their cords from us. Okay, that's what's, that's what, that's what's quoted, okay? Now, it doesn't finish quoting to their, to let us tear their fetters. It starts, stops right here. That's where the quote stops. But I think that it's implied to go all the way through this and that verse, cords from us. It picks up in verse 4. He who sits in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. Then he will speak to them in his anger and terrifying them in his fury, saying, But as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. I will surely tell them of the decree of the Lord. He said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me. And I will surely give the nations as your inheritance and the very ends of the earth as your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall shatter them like earthenware. Now, therefore, O kings, show discernment. Take warning, O judges of the earth. Worship the Lord with reverence and rejoice with trembling. Do homage to the sun that he will not become angry and you will perish in the way. For his wrath may soon be kindled. How blessed are all who take refuge in him. So in Acts chapter 4, we see a reference to the first two verses. Then the rest of Psalms is not quoted. Keep that in mind, okay? This psalm begins with a description that describes the rebellion of the nations against the Lord and against his anointed. Despite their plans, however, the Lord laughs and asserts his authority, appointing his king. Those who seek refuge in the Son will avoid his wrath. The psalm concludes with a blessing for those who take refuge in him. Okay? Now, Psalm 2, if you have a reference Bible, will often point out Acts chapter 4, obviously, because it quotes Psalm 2. But then it goes in the same reference points out Revelation 12.5. Now, I looked at Revelation 12.5, I'm like, and she will give birth to a son, a maid child, who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up to God and to his throne. Revelation 19.15 is also a normal uh, cross-reference, which says, from his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He treads the wine presses of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty. So when you read Psalm 2, which is obviously very messianic, I, it's still one of the, 
the, the word son is contested within the, the, um, the Masoretic text. They, they, they say it shouldn't be son. I like the translation son. I think it's very consistent and literal, and it kind of forces the issue for a lot of Jews, by the way, and ask them who's the son there. But it does uh, refer to a question. How are prophecies fulfilled? How did the apostles and the disciples interpret Psalm chapter 2, verses 1 and 2? We read it already. For truly in this city they were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you appointed both Herod and Pontius Pilate, and the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel. All the kings came together against Jesus. But they say, well, this is only partially fulfilled because obviously all the kings of the earth come against the Christ in Revelation as well. Not only during the tribulational period, but also at the end of the thousand-year reign of Christ. So people have gone through Psalm chapter 2 or have written um, various different commentaries concerning this and basically have said, well, there's multiple fulfillments. So Psalm chapter 2 is fulfilled in part. It's, it's fulfilled in Acts in, in the, the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, but it's also fulfilled later. So there's multiple fulfillments. Um, I have always been taught this is a partial fulfillment. That there's a there's it's kind of like a, a part A to the fulfillment that they were up against him in the, in the Christ during his time on earth, but they'll also be together against him in the future. And then there is a perpetual fulfillment. We're basically all the people are always against God and his Christ, even today and in the previous uh, generations and also in the future generations. So multiple fulfillment, partial fulfillment, or perpetual fulfillment. Well, I want to be very clear. I don't think any of those are accurate. I believe that Revelation is not quoting or does not refer to the prophecies of Psalm 2, 1 and 2. In fact, Revelation does not quote Psalm 2 at all. I think there is an allusion to it speaking of the of the Messiah ruling with a rod of iron, but it does not quote Psalm 2 in regards to the nations rising up against the, 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 the anointed, the Christ. So when I see Acts chapter 4, quote Psalm 2, 1 and 2, and then apply it directly to the crucifixion, I believe that is a direct fulfillment of Psalm 2, verses 1 and 2, verses 1 through 3. What about the rest of Psalm? Well, I, if you read the rest of Psalm 2, I believe it is very direct that Psalm 2, 4 through 12 is talking about the king, the installation of the king, not the suffering servant. When is the king installed? At the kingdom. So direct, basically the day of the Lord is being referenced in Psalm 2, 4 through 12. So what do you have in Psalm 2? You have a reference to the first advent, along with reference to the second advent. In Psalm 2, 4 through 12, you can see it fulfilled in the book of Revelation, but not the first three verses of Psalm 2. That makes sense? You have that also in Zechariah, verses, uh, portions in Isaiah, uh, dealing with Jesus coming to earth and being the suffering servant, and then later on in the same passages, being the one who is coming to rule and reign and to, to, to rule with an iron fist and to destroy his enemies. So I just wanted to point that out because I have always been taught that Psalm 2 is partially fulfilled in the first advent and partially fulfilled in the second advent. And I go, well, let's be more specific. Psalm 1, 2, 1 and 2, or 1 through 3, is about the first advent, him as a suffering servant, nations rising against him. Psalm 2, 4 through 12 is eschatological, dealing with his kingship. The events that took place for truly in this city, they were gathered together against your holy servant, Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your purpose predestined to occur. So the events that took place were terrible. However, they were in the con still in the control of God. And this is where we've had conversations previously, in which we'll simply just reference them here, not really defend them fully, about sovereignty and omniscience. Does the sovereignty of God mean that
that he chose those individuals to do things that were evil. Pontius Pilate, Herod, I'm, you, I'm, I'm forcing you, I've created you to do these bad things. Well, that would make God the author of evil, and he never says he does that. So the people that rebelled and crucified Jesus were destined to do it based upon his omniscience. He didn't force him to do it, but he controlled the environment so that the evil people would have the opportunity to do as they willed. While Jesus was on earth, at his birth, did not the first Herod seek to kill him? Sure. Unsuccessfully. Why? God's sovereignty. He moved Jesus. Tell him, get out. Likewise, next Herod, which is just a title, by the way, sought to kill Jesus, along with the Sanhedrin. Pontius Pilate, being in fear, gave in to those things. The people of Israel also stood against Jesus. Was he telling them to do it? Or did he allow the circumstances to occur so that evil men would have their way? Sovereignty. Omniscience. He knows what will happen, so therefore he can tell for certainty the future events, but also sovereignty does not mean that we're all just pawns. Rather, it means that when he wants to interfere in the history of man, he is fully capable and has the right to do so. So no, he didn't choose if I had lemon tea tonight. That's fully within my realm of choice. We also knew I would have the lemon tea. Omniscience. Sovereignty. If he wanted to stop me from drinking this tea, he could do so very quickly and at his will. Sovereignty. The fact that I will finish it is within his omniscience. All right. Not playing around. But keep that in mind. When you see these types of statements made by the apostles, don't think that God is manipulating these people as pawns and just doing what he wants. Rather, he is allowing the circumstances to play out so that his will would take place concerning the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Now, once again, and now, Lord, take note of their threats. Who are the there? The same people, Herod, Pontius Pilate, the Gentiles, and the people of Israel. The same people that were up against the Christ, against the Messiah, who called for his crucifixion and carried it out, those same people now stand against them. So take note of them. Remember Psalm chapter, uh, Psalm 146. I lost my place. Yeah, Psalm 146. That God is, God is the one who will take care of the wicked. They're the wicked. Take note of them. Deal with them so that we can go ahead and do what we need to do. And then they ask, or prayer. So the same Jewish leaders who stood against the Messiah now stand against them. Then they pray for assistance. What is their prayer? This is very important. They, they've come through full recognition. The first Everything we've talked about so far is simply recognition of who God is, moniker, creation, prophecy, what has happened. He's in full control. Now take note of them. The wicked, those who stand in opposition to us, and they pray for assistance. What is their prayer? It's one thing. One thing. Grant that your bondservants may speak your word with all confidence. Speak your word, the word of the Lord, with all confidence confidence. By the way, I'll mention this second, verse 30, while that is a participle, okay? So it is not the prayer, it is things that are occurring at the same time as the request. We'll see why that is in a moment. First, all confidence is the word parousia. Parousia is a word that means a use of speech that conceals nothing and passes over nothing. Saying something clearly without any fear of reprisal, without any concern about what might be said in return, without any, I don't care who hears it, 
and I don't care what happens because of it. Another definition, a state of boldness and confidence. But the word itself often is connected to speech that is unhindered. In other words, it's not speaking boldly, emotionally, or without fear solely. It's let us speak boldly without fear because there's nothing in our way. So when Paul often prays for boldness, he is not simply praying from on his end, but also the fact that there's nothing that's blocking him. There's nothing that's, that's causing any type of stumbling block for him. In Acts 28, 30 through 31, this word is used where Paul is in Rome in house arrest. He stayed in his, in his two full years in his own rented quarters and was welcoming all to, who came to him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching concerning the Lord Jesus Christ with all openness unhindered. Boldly unhindered. So it's these are often connected to one another. So why can we speak with boldness now? Why can I stand up here and say precisely what the Bible has to say? Because currently, currently, at least for at least another couple months, currently, I can speak boldly unhindered. What if Facebook takes me off? It's not. Is that really a hindrance? No. Okay, we have other avenues to get the word out. But here, there's no one who is challenging. There's no one saying stop that. There's no guns pointed our way. Unhindered. Therefore, we can also speak with boldness. By the way, this same boldness is used in Acts 2.29. Brethren, I may confidently say, boldly say, unhindered, with full, without fear regarding the patriarch David. Now, what's, what's the bold speech there? David died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Like, we could, we could say very clearly, very boldly, unhindered. No one's going to argue with us that David's dead, and we can still go to his bones. Acts 4.31, and when they had prayed, the place where they had gathered was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of, the word of God with boldness. This is one of the reasons why I say that previous to this moment that they were still driven by fear. They were not as bold as they needed to be, primarily because of their own fear, but also that they have perceived or was in fact being blocked, that there were people standing in opposition. But with Peter and Paul, Peter and John going in front of the Sanhedrin saying precisely what God wanted them to say, and them going, well, just stop it, and then letting them go, tells them what? There's nothing standing in our way. Therefore, speak even more boldly with all boldness, unhindered, full effect. Now, what is the means for the boldness, confident, unhindered speech? The simple answer is they were filled with the Holy Spirit. But I don't think that's the answer. Oh, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. They had a, a, an ability to have boldness and confident, unhindered, because they were directly empowered by the Holy Spirit to do so. But that's not what it says. Verse 30, while you extend your hand to heal and signs and wonders take place through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. What is the means for their boldness in Israel during this time? Credentials. What allowed Peter and John to speak unhindered? The Sanhedrin couldn't say anything against them. Why? For a notable miracle has occurred. What are you going to say? 
yes, this miracle occurred, but these people speak blasphemy. You, we, that the, the whole point of, of the Jews was God does not hear people who are evil and speak against him. He's not going to allow a miracle to occur like this if they're bad. So the means is a continuation of healing and showing signs and wonders. If those things continue to occur, then we know we can speak unhindered with all boldness, confident, because we know that we have the credentials necessary to be able to stand up to the people that would oppress us and try to stop us. By the way, the word heal is the same word from Acts 4.22, so there's no question about the, the concept of healing here, that they're referring to the man who was healed um, that was more than 40 years old, the, 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 the lame man at the gate called Beautiful. The miracle of healing had been performed. So this is the direct reference. Continue on with this. They understood the credentials meant unhindered speech. So once again, I already answered this question, but why were Peter and John let go without punishment? The miracle caused the Sanhedrin to stop and not punish Peter and John because the people witness a miracle and they cannot deny it. They feared the people. Miracles permitted them to speak. Then God answered the prayer. Now, very interestingly enough, um, it, it, this, this goes back to Old Testament lessons. When I remember, I used to go over things that, he, that were happening, going, I go, strange things are happening. Things that we have not seen, we have not, we have not felt this. And so when God fulfilled the prayer, when he is telling them, I'm, I'm in agreement with this, that this is what I'm going to do. God answered in a literal, direct, and undeniable manner. When we talked about it on Sunday, that at times as Christians, we like to go out and look for signs. We pray, and then we go out and look at the wind. Look and say, is that, is that, is, is that God answering my prayer? A little shake of the leaf there? And we interpret happenstance. As a sign from God. Here's what I'll tell you. When God wants to answer a prayer, he does so in a literal, direct, and undeniable manner. He, he shakes the place. When they were praying for the power of the Holy Spirit in Acts 2, was it undeniable, direct, and literal? Absolutely. Big whooshing wind, tongues of flame of fire came and prayed over their head. They spoke in tongues. Literal, direct, undeniable manner. Then, as I kind of stated, either they lost their boldness or they never were fully bold from Acts 2. I believe that Acts chapter 4 and what happens from that point forward, they begin speaking all boldness in the congregation of those who believe are one heart, one soul. All this happened as a reinstatement and a re-energized call to prepare for the king, coming of Jesus and the coming kingdom. They were, they were re-energized. They were like, okay, okay, we're ready to go. Now, the one thing that we have to point out is that we read Acts 1, 2, 3, 4. We read all those chapters. How long does it take us to read it? If you're a slow reader like me, maybe 15. That's slow. If you're a fast reader like Sarah, maybe four. Right? You read. And what, we, what do we assume about it? It's all within the span of about four days. Could you read it like that? What's the time span between Acts 2 and Acts 4? I have no idea. My assumption, based upon the fact that I know that Acts is usually written in kind of like in notable time frames, things that happen in notable, notable sequences, not in immediate uh, time frame, but things that happen and that are very notable. This could have been months, maybe even a couple of years. I don't think it's like 15, 20 years, but I think that over a couple year period, at, at, the, at the very most, one or two years, that they are the difference between Acts 2 and Acts 4. So 
So you have the events of Acts 2, Pentecost, speaking in tongues, seeing all the, uh, the Jews that were from, uh, from the diaspora. Then they all go home. They have this little commune thing. They're doing well. They're all talking, and they're very, feeling very confident with all kinds of things. But they're still not being as bold as necessary. And it goes on for a couple months like that. And then Peter and John decide it's time to take it up a notch. Maybe directed by the Holy Spirit. Go into the temple. Sees the guy sitting there. Again, they've seen him lots of times before. Now, through the power of Jesus Christ, power of the Holy Spirit, he gets healed. Now they go into the temple and 5,000 people pay attention. Now the confrontation with the Sanhedrin. Now they speak confidently, boldly to the Sanhedrin. They get released by the Sanhedrin, the same ones that killed the Christ. They're free to go on with just threats. And now the apostles and disciples go, okay, now there's nothing standing in our way. If the Sanhedrin can't do anything to us, who can? Continue on with these miracles. We pray that we speak with boldness. The place was shaken. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God with boldness. This is really, really turns up the intensity. And what happens? Well, Acts 4, 32 to 35. And the congregation of those who believed with one heart and one soul. Not one of them claimed anything belonging to them was his own, but all things were common property to them. And with great power, the apostles were giving testimony of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and abundant grace was upon them all. But there was not a needy person among them, for all who were owners of land or houses would sell them and bring the proceeds of the sales and lay them at the apostles' feet. And they would be distributed to each one as any had need. So, one mind, one breath, complete generosity, lack of self in the community, great power, testifying about the resurrection, resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and not one was needy. This is almost verbatim, by the way, of Acts 2 at the end. The same commune reestablished or growing. So, after seeing all of Acts 1 through 4, because Acts 5, we begin something completely different, okay? What can we take here? What's the lesson we can learn? Are we apostles? No. So we got to be careful, right? We can't just go, well, we can pray for the same thing. If we're persecuted, let's say, for example, over the next couple of years, things get rough for Christians in our neighborhoods in America. Do we pray this prayer? Well, we're not there with them. We're, we didn't see the, the gathering of the nations together against Jesus Christ. This, those are all the same people. So therefore, we, it would be inappropriate for this. Should we pray that we speak boldness, giving us miracles? Remember, we have the completed word of God. We have no need for credentials. The Bible is the, ba is the baseline for the authority. We're simply reiterators, students of it, teachers of it. We don't need a credential behind us because we have the word of God fully and completely. That's the authority. This is what we point to. So I would say it's not appropriate for us to pray for miracles for the cause for this cause. Now, again, as I've stated very clearly, I believe God is fully sovereign, capable, omnipotent. He's fully capable of doing so. Is that what he wants us to do? But there's one thing that we should do. The lesson that we could learn from this, and it's very consistent throughout all the Bible, no matter when we look is that we must be bold, unafraid, and unconcerned with what man might do to us. Always. I, I really enjoy 2 Corinthians chapter 3 on this. Are we beginning to commend ourselves again, or do we need as some letters of commendation from, to you or from you? You are our letter, written on our hearts, known and read by all men, being manifested that you are a letter of Christ, cared for by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on the tablets of human hearts. Such confidence we have through Christ toward God. Not that we are adequate in ourselves to consider anything as coming from ourselves, but our adequacy is from God, 
who also made us adequate as servants of a new covenant, not the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. But if the ministry of death in letters engraved on stones came with glory, so that the sons of Israel could not look intently at the face of Moses because of the glory of his face fading as it was, how will the ministry of the spirit fail to be even more with glory? For if the ministry of condemnation has glory, much more does the ministry of righteousness abound in glory. Meaning condemnation was of the law. Salvation by grace through faith, understanding of our reconciliation to God is righteousness. For indeed, what had glory, in this case, has no glory because of the glory that surpasses it. Yes, the law was good, right and perfect. And I had a certain amount of glory. But the message of Jesus Christ surpasses that. For if that which fades away was with glory, much more than which remains in glory. Therefore, having such a hope, there, having such a hope, the hope that is in Christ now, not the law, but in grace, because we, we live by grace, we use great boldness in our speech. Several times, Philippians 2, Philippians 4, Ephesians 5, Paul talks about speaking with boldness, not because of miracles, but because of truth. And we can do the same thing. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word that we can learn and grow, see the principles behind it, and read about your history, seeing how the apostles were developed and understood, overcoming through, your, through their fears because of your great power. Not because of anything within them, but because of your will. And we thank you for that. Help us to learn and grow and to represent you correctly. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.